It's time to open the case files of the radio detective, Jerry Pierce, mm. a veteran cop, an old school detective with stories to tell. Real crime in real time. The Radio Detective. I'm Jerry Pierce, the Radio Detective. Welcome to Friday Night Show. Got the weekend coming up. I hope you all got something planned. I know I do, and I'm glad this week's over, Jason. Jason Cunning, the super producer's at the board tonight, and our own Kathy Isom's on the telephones. We're going to talk uh, about the killing of Robert Kennedy again tonight. You know, I've done a series of these things, and we're going to continue to press on this. But before we get to that portion of the show and open that case file, I was thinking about that business where we, as you know, broadcast from the California State Prison at Corcoran the other day. And, you know, while I was in the middle of a tour they gave Jason and I and my son Lance Pierce, we, we were in the very bowels of that institution, and I, and I saw some things there that are probably going to stick with me a long time. And I, I'm not novice when it comes to being inside state prisons, but Corcoran's a special place. And, you know, and the thought I had when I was in there, I was walking across the uh, four-level mainline yard there was with uh, Rod Nason and and uh, Sylvia and and and, and uh, the, the other people and I looked around and I thought to myself, what a waste of human life. You know, the men doing time in that joint could have at some point made a different choice and they wouldn't be there. And I and I thought that each and every one of those inmates had the power in their own hands. To make, a de- to make a decision to not become some lost soul down there behind those cement walls. And I've said on this very show many times that you should not surrender leadership to others. You are in control of your life. You are the captain of your ship. And if you end up at a particular place, remember it was you that took yourself there. Now, if there's young people listening to this show, and I know there is, I want you to remember what I'm telling you tonight. When it's all said and done, the choices one makes in their life are the only thing that really counts. And there's rarely a situation that comes along in where you had no choice. You cannot escape making choices. Your destiny is literally in your hands until you surrender that leadership to others. And every man behind those walls at some point made a decision. And that decision was theirs and theirs alone. The decision they made was the wrong decision. And they're now paying for it with their lives. Some of those men would say they had no choice, but they're wrong. God gives himself, God himself gives it to us. He gives us the ability, the competence, and the skill to make choices. And he leaves the rest up to us. And in the cases of those men in that joint, It's almost surely a series of bad choices, not just one. They had many opportunities to change their course of direction, and they passed on it. Now, particularly if you're a young person and listening to me in this radio program, I'm reminding you of this. There are both penalties and rewards for the decisions you make in your life. You will surely rape what you sow, and that's a fact of life. And if you do something that goes against the law of life, you're going to pay the price. And that price can be very, very high. I can tell you this. If you could have seen what I saw in that joint during that tour, you might think real hard the next time you thought about committing a crime. If you make a wrong choice, the first one may be on us. But if you make another wrong choice, the second one is on you. You think about that. I'm Jerry Pierce, the radio detective. We're going to be right back with our regular show, Don't Go Away. If you think the room is bugged, grab the cordless and step outside. Talk to Jerry Pierce, the radio detective. June 5, 1968, in the city of Los Angeles. It wasn't long after midnight on the morning of June 5, 1968, Senator Robert F. Kennedy finished up his victory speech at the historic Ambassador Hotel on Wilshire Boulevard in Los Angeles. He had just won the California primary in his effort to secure the Democratic nomination to be the party's presidential candidate in November. As Kennedy was about to leave the stage, things started to happen. L.A. Rams tackle Roosevelt Greer 
been working with Kennedy's California campaign, went on to tell the old LAPD, well, first of all, we were up on the stage, and then they said we were going off to the right of the stage, and at the last minute, Bill Berry decided to change and go a different direction because people had found out which way the senator was going to go, and we had to go downstairs to another ballroom where people were waiting. This was a press gathering here, and so Bill Berry and someone else took the senator down, and I was lifting Mrs. Kennedy down from the stairs, and we started walking. Now, Kennedy left the podium. He walked down the ramp, entered a pair of swinging doors, heading east. Between the stage and the press area was the kitchen pantry. There was food there for the guest at the ambassador, and that's where they prepared it. Mater D. Carl Euchre gripped Kennedy's right wrist and with his left hand. An Ace Guard Service employee, Thane Eugene Caesar, joined Kennedy as he went through the double doors into the pantry. Caesar was touching Kennedy's right elbow. Bill Barry, an ex-FBI agent, was ostensibly serving as Kennedy's bodyguard, and he had fallen behind as they entered the pantry. And as they headed east through the room, Kennedy stopped every few feet to shake the hands of hotel workers. And the last hand he shook that night was that of a busboy, Juan Romero. Euchre pulled Kennedy as he moved forward. The tiny kitchen held by official count 77 people, including Searhan and the shooting victims, who were possible witnesses to what happened. Euchre related that uh, with Kennedy still in hand, he felt someone sliding in between himself and the steam table about two feet away from where he stood. Busboy Juan Romero and waiter Martin Petruski saw Searhan approach Kennedy, as did Lisa Yurso, a San Diego high school student. Yurso saw Searhan push his way past everyone and past her towards the senator, and everybody thought he was going to shake his hand. And then the shots rang out. A split second before the shot, someone said, grab him. And that's when Euchre felt Kennedy slip from his grasp, grasp and he fell to the ground. The screaming started. There were some bystanders that were injured and shot. Some were hit by flying bullets. Kennedy suffered gunshot wounds in three different places, and a fourth bullet passed through his coat without entering his skin. Now, I'm going to tell you in the first two shows we did on this, I was asked by uh, someone to review the police files and what, what police files they had, including the coroner's report regarding Robert Kennedy. And for years, I, along with everybody else in the country, were con was convinced Sirhan Sirhan shot Robert Kennedy. In fact, I was a deputy sheriff on the night it happened. My partner and I had just kicked in the door of some narcotic dealer's pad, and we were searching the place when we got notified by headquarters that uh, Robert Kennedy had been killed in Los Angeles. So I won't forget the night it happened. So we thought, well, they got him. Until I started this program the other day on regarding the, the killing of Kennedy, and I did this story and started doing these stories after reading some material that was given me. And one of those documents was the coroner's report. Coroner Noguchi from Los Angeles County, unequivocally, for you in Goshen, that means without hesitation, says the cause of death to Robert Kennedy was a contact wound behind the right ear. I then looked at the charts and saw that he was shot twice under the armpit and that the bullets go up at about a 70 degree angle into the body. I looked further and found witnesses they had interviewed that had no pony in that race. And each individual witness said Searhand at all times was in front of Kennedy, his arm extended in a horizontal position from his body between three and six feet away at all times. Now I gotta ask you, do you think all the questions have been answered in the killing of Robert Kennedy? So I started doing some shows on it. And I had on Miss Mangan, 
had on Del Sirhan, Sirhan Sirhan's brother. We talked to her about her research. We listened to Adele give his opinion of what he thought happened uh, in this whole case. I had on uh, the author, uh, the, the first one was the guy from the University of Massachusetts, and Philip Melanson, he told you what he thought happened here. Well, tonight we're going to go back a little bit, and we're going to go to a former police officer. He's a former narcotics officer with the LAPD. His name is Michael C. Rupert. We're going to talk about Michael. We're going to talk about his website. And I became familiar with Michael Rupert when he called the director of the CIA a liar in a public forum in South Central Los Angeles regarding the director's uh, disassociation of the CIA from the drugs coming into Los Angeles. So let's get to it. Michael has some interesting things to tell you about his knowledge of files that the LAPD had on the killing of Robert Kennedy. Michael Rupert, welcome to the show, sir. It is a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, Jerry. Mike, let me ask you, first of all, tell us about yourself for a moment before we get into this, uh, about your LAPD. You were there quite some time on the LAPD. Well, actually, no, not really. I Not anywhere near as long as I wanted to be, I'll tell you that. Mm -hmm. um, I had uh, interned for LAPD for three years while I was an undergraduate at UCLA uh, from 69 through 72. Uh, but what had happened was, while I was interning, uh, the LAPD, having done a background on me, discovered that my mother had been with the Army Security Agency and the National Security Agency, that she had been involved with Franklin Roosevelt's uh, summit conference in uh, Tehran in 1943, that she had uh, been involved in, in a mission to Moscow in 1943, that my father had, was working on uh, projects for the CIA from, with Martin Marietta Corporation, relatives of my father were active CIA employees. I, I come from a whole family of spies. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was uh, uh, groomed, if you will, and chosen. Uh, I was one of two living Republicans on the UCLA campus from 1969 to 1973, uh, the other being a guy named Craig Fuller, who wound up being George Bush's chief of staff during Iran-Contra. Right. Uh, Craig was chosen to intern for Governor Reagan and I for Chief Ed Davis at LAPD. Um uh, so I did the internships uh, through uh, uh, four divisions uh, while I was an undergrad, but I, but I worked for the chief, and that's where I began to meet and be groomed by, if you will, receive commendations from and, and special attention from people who were part of uh, the events on June 5th, 68. Uh, I, I went on to become a, a police officer, was valedictorian of my academy class in 73, hit the street, and was, uh, was only on as a sworn uh, badge and gun guy until the end of 1978. Uh, but by that time, I had discovered uh, through my fiance, who was a CIA agent, that the agency was dealing large quantities of guns, er, excuse me, drugs, uh, and and uh, moving guns out of the country. And as I tried to report that, because I wouldn't overlook the drugs, that's when my career came to an end. Right. Now let's go back a little bit, uh, Michael. And um, well, tell us first of all, you've got a website, and uh, I've looked at it several times, and. Um, you also have a newsletter from the Wilderness Publications, right? right? And tell us how to locate that website. There's people out here that are going to want to look at it and some of the material you talk about here on the show tonight. Why don't you give it to us? Okay. It's a very large website. Uh, the address is www, of course, dot cop v c i a dot com. If you think of the court case like Roe v. Wade, but just picture cop v the CIA, cop v c i a dot com. You'll come right to my website from the wilderness, and uh, that's where you can find out about the newsletter. We have 700 subscribers now, including 10 members of Congress and both intelligence committees from the Senate and the House. And just, uh, as I'm sure you know, Jerry, a whole boatload of documentation that's up there uh, and links to uh, and actual copies of real files up there. Right, absolutely. Uh, it's, by the way, an impressive website, Michael. Thank you. Let's, um, let's go back to Bobby Kennedy. There's an area you put on the website uh, titled, Bobby, I Didn't Know. Yes. Why don't you take us into this thing, and I'm going to let you run with it uh, and just kind of bring our audience here in California and elsewhere. Uh, we're being listened to, by the way, worldwide on the Internet at uh, kmphfm.com. And uh, so people around the world, uh, I'm going to try to get their attention, drawn more to this Kennedy thing for somebody to look at it one more time. But why don't you just open up and give us the background of how you got involved in becoming interested in the Bobby Kennedy deal? 
Well, it's a, it's a very strange story. I was a sophomore in high school on June 5th, 1968. And, uh, and I watched, I remember very well, uh, when Bobby was killed. And uh, I had no idea that my life was going to become involved with that. And I didn't for many, many years, as a matter of fact. But what had happened was that when I was first hired as a police student worker, that was the uh, title of the internship job in October 69, I was sent to Venice Division uh, near the beach in Los Angeles, and the captain at that time was a guy by the name of R.K. Sillings, and he had been Lieutenant Sillings, the Rampart Division watch commander the night Bobby was assassinated. Uh, working under him at Venice Division were a Lieutenant Tackaberry, uh, who had been with Metropolitan Division, that's the elite LAPD uh, field enforcement division, and a Sergeant Don Tudor. Both of those guys had been Metro on, an, on the night of June 5th and had been at Central Receiving Hospital when Bobby arrived there after having been shot. Mm-hmm. I was subsequently transferred to Rampart Division, which, of course, is where uh, uh, Bobby was shot. And then a short time later, uh, I was transferred to a Parker Center Working Accident Investigation Division, and, and there was no real connection to that case. But one day I'm sitting there working, minding my own business, and the phone rings, and I'm told to go up to the chief's office, which was a surprise. And I was pulled into the chief's office for a loan for a special project involving some fundraising stuff that Chief Davis had been doing by a guy named Sergeant Dave Brath, who was uh, Ed Davis's adjutant. Uh, Brath had been one of two, two scribes who wrote all 13 volumes, if you will, of the RFK assassination for LAPD. Uh, Dave Brath wrote me a huge commendation, uh, and a short time later, Commander Carol Kirby, who was running the inspection and control section of the chief's office, uh, uh, pulled me up and, and transferred me into the chief's office to work for himself and Chief uh, Davis. Mm-hmm. Uh, Carol Kirby was running uh, uh, inspection and control with LAPD's version of the uh, inspector general's office. Uh, Kirby uh, introduced me to a lot of intelligence people, uh, to some Army intelligence colonels who would uh, come, light, light colonels who would come in civilian clothes, and they would talk about things like garden plot. And it was then that I was told that I had a Q clearance, and I didn't even know what that was. I had to ask my father. Uh, and so what I began to see was there were CIA connections in the chief's office, and I had no idea why this was happening to me, except for perhaps maybe it was my family connections, and it was known then that I was a good Republican guy, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, after I joined LAPD, uh, my first loan into narcotics was arranged by a Sergeant Carl Thompson, uh, who I didn't find out until years later uh, had been with the Army Security Agency himself, and who had joined LAPD after leaving ASA, which is a very, very uh, secret organization. And uh, Carl Thompson had been part of Special Unit Senator. And also, uh, subsequently after my fiancé, who was a CIA agent, uh, started to introduce me to the connections, deeper connections between CIA and and LAPD, uh, I met Lee Goforth, who was a Brigadier General in the California Guard, who also was the department's rep to LEIU, the Law Enforcement Intelligence Unit. And Lee Goforth had been Ethel's bodyguard on the night of June 5th, 1968. Now, I knew none of this at the time. As a matter of fact, I didn't know any of this until 1992. Uh, I left LAPD at the end of 1978 uh, after I had tried to uh, expose the uh, drug trafficking and, and, and tried to do what I thought was the right thing to do. No good deed goes unpunished. And uh, so I had spent years out in the wilderness, so to speak, uh, trying to expose CIA and drugs. I had met a short, floppy-eared Texan with a big nose by the name of Ross Perot, and I was his press spokesman in the 92 presidential campaign here. Mm-hmm. And I'd made People magazine and uh, been on TV quite a bit, and an author, John Christian, uh, sought me out uh, right after the 92, uh, after Ross pulled out in 92. John co-authored probably the best work on the assassination of uh, Bobby Kennedy, and that, that's what it's entitled, is the, the assassination of Robert Francis Kennedy, with former FBI agent Bill Turner. And uh, John had in his possession uh, all 13 volumes of the LAPD investigation unredacted. There was uh, a tape recording made by an NPR reporter named West, John actually had the tape recorder uh, that actually recorded about 16 or 17 gunshots being fired. Uh, John and I traveled to Montana 
in the in the winter or fall of 1993, and I got to go through these 13 volumes, and it was only then that I discovered that almost everybody who had touched my early career, and many of the people who were re- who were responsible for connections to the drug trade were also the same people who were either at the Ambassador Hotel the night Bobby was killed or uh, who had been part of a really horrendous cover-up after the fact. Mm-hmm. Uh, I hesitate for a minute and take a breath. Let me remind my uh, listeners that we're listening to Michael C. Rupert. He's a former L.A. Uh, PD narcotics officer and uh, also has an interesting background with a lot of things ever since he got out of college. And uh, I've asked him to be on the show tonight in case you're just tuning in, to tell us what he discovered in regard to the killing of Robert Kennedy after he was on the LAPD and had a chance to get around some of the people on LAPD that were active and on duty and around the whole scene back on June 5, 1968, when Robert Kennedy was assassinated. So let me ask you now, Michael, you went out to the Montana and you had these files and you guys, what did you do, get a, a room someplace and start going through them, or what What happened there? Well, we were in about a 40-foot uh, Winnebago uh, on okay. the back of somebody's ranch property in western Montana. Pretty secluded, and we just started pulling things apart. Now, John had already been at this for some time, but because I had interned for LAPD and been exposed to a great many of the internal procedures of LAPD while I was a college student, I was able to look at the reports and pretty much pulled them apart piece by piece, and I was able to see uh, that LAPD had just, I mean, the only way I can describe it, Jerry, is to say flat out that LAPD was a part of the conspiracy before the fact to participate in the assassination of Robert Francis Kennedy. Okay. And I mean specifically to say that CIA agents and uh, probably deep cover officers within LAPD engineered that and i need to probably take a minute if i can to digress and talk about that you bet uh in the cia food chain the highest rung on the food chain at the agency is called an officer or a case officer that's when you are technically a part of the family you are like a card carrying um immune kind of guy the agency takes officers and sometimes places them deep cover. That kind of a recruitment pitch was made to me when I was a senior at UCLA. I was flown back to Washington, and uh, an agency guy said, we'd like you to become a case officer and, and send you back through the Los Angeles Police Academy. I did not do that. It made me very nervous. Uh, I took a stack full of documents. The guy wanted me to fill out for a background uh, checks, and I just never sent them back. Um, but below that, in the CIA rung, are various categories of agents. Now, they have career agents who spend their whole working lives, 25 years or so, working for the CIA. They also have ID cards, but they're called agents and not officers in that they don't possess the same levels of protection as the officers do. Then there are contract agents. Uh, There are foreign agents who are foreign nationals. There are informants. There are uh, contract employees who are not necessarily agents, people who, who uh, provide support services. There's a whole bunch of different classifications. So when I say CIA agents within LAPD, it could very well be an LAPD guy who had a good military background, maybe some military intelligence or military police, who the agency approached and said, hey, we'd like to put you on payroll. You make a couple hundred bucks a month extra. Or it could have been a deep cover case officer. But those are the guys within LAPD, I'm firmly convinced, who were aware that Bobby was going to be killed that night, who were there on the scene almost immediately as it happened, and certainly filled the ranks of special unit senator when the investigation was taking place. Okay. You know, uh, take us then to, take us to, you you made, when we talked uh, about this uh, before the show uh, off air the other day, you made mention that some things came to your attention regarding people moving into the hospital area before the shooting. Mm -hmm. Cover that for me, Michael, will you? Well, you have spent some time with LAPD during the era. Um, we only had, like, uh, we had very few radio frequencies in those, in those days. There was a divisional frequency, and then Metro, when they went out in the field, they would operate on a frequency we called TAC-1. Right. Uh, and their base station was called 114, which was the base station for Metro and SWAT. And when they went out, Metro was divided into four platoons, A, B, C, and D platoon. 
um, and R was the designation for Metro. So there were call tickets and there were tapes showing like R-10 David, which would be a lieutenant from D platoon. Um, and I'm just being, I'm creating examples here. Right. You know, R-30 Charles, which would be a sergeant from C platoon, uh, saying, uh, before the shooting, this is R-30 Charles, I'm out to CRH, Central Receiving Hospital, which is where Bobby was taken. Uh, R-47, meet me at CRH. There are tapes of Metro units uh, being moved into Central Receiving Hospital before the shooting. Um, they were on guard, or th- they were on standby in the area, but there was no particular reason for them to have been moving to Central Receiving at that time, because there should have been no anticipation that Bobby was going to be shot. Um, there were also other suspicious activities on the radio tapes from LAPD in that in those days when radio calls went out, there was like a horseshoe uh, area in, in uh, communications division where when an RTO would put out a call, she would time stamp it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what I, what I saw was that there were differing time stamps, handwritten numbers, and times on some of the calls assigning Rampart units calls to and around the hotel before the shooting took place. Right. Um, so what, what was very clear to me was that people were being moved before the first shots were fired. And there was a guy who kind of uh, screwed things up for, uh, for the plan. That was Paul Shiraga, uh, who was an LAPD sergeant who normally would have been out in the field that night, but at the last minute, uh, Bob Sillings, a lieutenant, and the lieutenants did not normally go out in the field said, you stay in the station, I'm going out in the field. And Chiraga, uh, uh, excuse me, Sillings took a, uh, the, one other sergeant with him. Chiraga said, well, okay, let me go get a pack of smokes. Uh, stuck a six-inch thirty-eight in his waistband, hopped into a black and white, and drove to his favorite pop spot, if you're competent, where you get your free cigarettes in those days. Mm-hmm. And that liquor store happened to be right at the back driveway of the Ambassador Hotel, and that's where Chiraga was the moment the call came out. So he was able to just pull right into the parking lot in the midst of the pandemonium, and of course what he saw was subsequently altered and changed uh, in SUS reports. Now I, wanna, I want you to hold it right there for a moment. Keep that thought in mind. When I get back, I want to go into that. My special guest uh, this hour is Michael C. Rupert. He is a former Los Angeles police officer and narcotics officer. And uh, I have asked him to come on the show tonight because once he was on LAPD, he became aware of information That pertains to the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy on June 5, 1968. And Michael has joined us. We're going through some things right now. If you want to join the program a little later when we finish talking here about the underlying case and you have questions for uh, Michael and or comments, I'll open up the lines a little later. Remember these numbers, 252-1075 and toll free 877-575-1075. I've told you as your radio detective, that I think something's wrong here. And I based my decision to open up these investigations of this case uh, on the basis of reading some reports that were furnished me, official reports, which clearly lay out, at least the one report clearly lays out, that Kennedy died from a bullet through the right side of his head behind his ear. And more importantly, it was a contact wound which means it was either up against the skin or close to it, maybe an inch out. And maybe one criminal has said you go a little more than an inch, but it was close in behind the right ear. And I've said to you upon review of everything else I could find so far, that most of the witnesses who had no pony in the race said Sirhan was always in the front area of Kennedy, wasn't behind him. And I've told you further, the coroner's report has two shots in the armpit entering and going up at about a 70, rough figures, a 70-degree angle. Now, you got to stop and think about that. I further did some research on the bullet travel, and the bullet travel in Kennedy's body was from back to front, from back to front, once the bullets entered the body. you got to think about what I'm saying here. Now, if Sirhan was in front of him, with his arm extended in, in a horizontal fashion, with a gun in his hand and firing bullets, alleged bullets, at Kennedy. And the bullets that entered and killed Kennedy were from the rear and were contact wounds 
one behind the mastoid area of the right ear, and the other under the armpit going up and to the front. I want you to tell me how Sirhan killed him because that's going to be the work of a magician. Let's go back to my special guest. Michael, thanks for holding. Uh, we're right in the middle of Chiraga, and you're talking about some data that was changed. Well, lots of data was changed. Paul uh, kept a copy of the report that he wrote that night, and uh, that differed from a report that was later part of the official investigation that had apparently been rewritten by L Lieutenant Manny Pena, who had uh, extraordinarily well-documented ties to the CIA. He had... Uh, retired from LAPD, uh, I use that term loosely, uh, gone to work for the Agency for International Development uh, and returned to LAPD. Now, let me, let, me, let me interrupt you, Michael, one minute for my listeners, okay? Okay. I know that the Agency for International Development is an intelligence organization. Yes. Because they tried to recruit me. So I'm telling you that when he says the Agency for International Development has great weight that you need to pay attention to, if somebody says they work for AID, you might as well say they work for the CIA. So just remember that as we go along. I'm sorry for interrupting you, Michael. That's all right. Go right ahead, sir. Paul discovered that his report had been rewritten. Uh, but Paul was present at a time when, of course, there was great pandemonium and, and chaos. Paul was in the back parking lot of the hotel, which is where one key witness, Sandy Serrano, came out after she had allegedly heard the uh, scene, two people running out going, we shot him, we shot him, we shot Senator Kennedy. Uh, and there were other officers there trying to broadcast descriptions of these suspects other than Sirhan Sirhan. Now, I, I mentioned Commander Carol Kirby as the guy who put me into the chief's office uh, as an intern. Well, Carol Kirby, on the night of June 5, 68, was the captain commanding officer of LAPD's communications division. Mm -hmm. And he showed up at the hotel roughly 20 minutes after the shooting, right at the time when officers were trying to broadcast these additional descriptions, and mysteriously there was a nine-minute radio blackout. Not a single transmission was, was made anywhere in the metropolitan area of Los Angeles. By the time the radios had come back up and a CP had been established, command post had, had been established, uh, the official version was being broadcast by Commander Powers saying that there was only one suspect, and he was in custody. Uh, and this directly contradicts much of uh, all the eyewitness testimony who saw it, but also the, uh, the, the accounts of several officers who were trying to broadcast the descriptions of the other suspects. And, and you also in there, Michael, remember uh, about the little old couple that was knocked down uh, as these people ran out of the uh, hotel saying those words, right? Right. Yes, there was... There were several witnesses to this couple running out of the pantry area and down the back stairs saying, we shot Senator Kennedy, we shot him, we shot him. This would have been after the point in time when the infamous lady with the polka dot dress uh, had moved into Sir Han's field of view, and some of the reports placed Sir Han out in the ambassador ballroom where Bobby was giving his uh, victory speech. Um, and for those who have studied the assassination, it's uh, pretty clear to all of us that the woman in the polka dot uh, dress was his uh, trigger, his hip hypnotic trigger for his programming to uh, lapse into the mode where he would walk into the pantry, confront Senator Kennedy with his eight shot, I think it was Ivers and Johnson, mm -hmm. 22, uh, and just keep shooting and shooting and shooting. One of the things that I noticed in the reports, um, and you're absolutely right, there were 76 witnesses in the pantry that night, mm -hmm. and not one of them, not a single one of them, placed Sirhan in any position where he could have fired the fatal wounds. Bob Uecker grabbed him immediately and threw him down on the steam table. Rayford Johnson jumped on him. You hear voices on the tape in the background saying, break his wrist, break his thumb if you have to, get the gun, get the gun. Because Sirhan was still clicking, even after he had uh, expended all eight chambers. But what, what, what I saw was unusual. I'm also something of a, of a firearms buff and an expert, and uh, I managed the largest gun store in the state down here, B&B, &B, for a few years. People reported from this little 2-inch uh, 22 extraordinarily loud reports and extremely large muzzle flashes. And I have spoken with uh, both uh, Lynn Mangan uh, and uh, Larry Teeter, the attorney for Sirhan and his chief researcher, and I am of the opinion that Sirhan was firing blanks. Mm -hmm. The reason being is that if you have an overcharged uh, 22 round with, with an extra dose of powder in the gun, 
you get this extra loud report in muzzle flash, which, which of course is a perfect diversion. On the other hand, standing immediately behind Bobby Kennedy, as you so well described, was then Eugene Cesar, uh, a guard from Ace Security, uh, who had just joined that company from Lockheed Aircraft Corporation, who was in the perfect position to fire the wounds, or fire the bullets. And he was carrying, according to the police reports, a six inch barreled, 38 caliber revolver. Mm-hmm. Well, anyone who's been around firearm stores knows that one of the most popular guns for target practice is a 22 on, mounted on a frame for a 38 or 357, because mm-hmm. it gives you perfect control. And from the side, you cannot tell the difference between a 22 and a 38 on a 38 frame. It looks exactly the same. The only way you would be able to tell would be to look at the barrel. Now, with a six inch barrel, and normal 22 rounds, because all the powder burns inside the barrel, there is no muzzle flash, and you get a much softer report. So while everybody's looking at Sirhan, it was the perfect distraction for Thane Cesar. And I will say this on your radio show, and I pray that he comes and sues me, that Thane Cesar is the guy who shot Bobby Kennedy. He's the assassin. He, he, he drew his uh, uh, 22 uh, on the 38 frame out of his holster, placed it behind Bobby's temple, put two in the armpit, and as Bobby was falling and turning, he grabbed Thane Cesar's tie, and one of the most famous photographs of all is a dying Bobby Kennedy being held uh, by the uh, busboy, but there is a clip-on police tie lying on the floor right next to Bobby. That's Thane Cesar's tie. And, and you, you have to, uh, Michael, let me just say that, I mean, and when you look at the facts, uh, the, just the facts I've, and I obviously I haven't seen some of the stuff you've seen, maybe I've seen stuff you haven't seen, but when you look at the facts, there's no one else in position to Kennedy's right, is there? No. No one else. I mean, nope. I've looked through everything I can, and I can find no opportunity for anybody else to be in that position. The only person that everybody says was there was this fellow Caesar. Now, one of the things that would have made that case one way or the other is, of course, all, all of the witness t- statements uh, go along with what you and I are saying. That's what they said. There was a young photographer named Scott Enyart in the uh, pantry that night. And I have been in the pantry. I have stood there. And uh, he was taking photographs as the assassination was taking place. And he took uh, hundreds of photographs. The problem is is that LAPD destroyed every one of them. Uh, 2,400 they destroyed, I'm told. Yes, well, they weren't all Scots. But Scott just won, I think it was a, uh, two years ago, a large settlement against LAPD after all these years for destroying his photographs taken that night inside the pantry. They had no reason to do that unless they were covering something up. Well, you know, let me ask you this, and, and we'll, we'll go into the next hour with more of it, but uh, as we get towards the top of this hour, we have a few minutes here. Who else in the department uh, besides you, Michael? Uh, I mean, I take it there's others that feel there's something out of order here in this whole thing. Well, LAPD is a big department. It's 10,000 guys now. When I was on, it was about 7,100 7, sworn. Very, very, very few of the personnel, sworn personnel in LAPD, had any idea uh, the depth of the CIA's penetration of LAPD. However, once you got to a certain point, if you were exposed to it, you began to see that certain guys, like an LAPD's bomb squad, Arlie McCree, was a, was a absolute best bomb man in all of CIA, and he was an LAPD cop. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hank Hernandez, who worked in SUS, bragged, and I consulted for a BB, uh, BBC documentary in 1992. And Hank, BBC got a tape of Hank Hernandez bragging about going all over the world to perform polygraph examinations for the agency, for the government. This was the guy who ran special unit senator with Manny Pena. So very few people knew the, the depth of the CIA involvement, but they, they were very key people. There was one guy in particular, a detective by the name of Bill Rathburn, who rose to become an assistant chief with LAPD, a deputy chief, excuse me. Uh, who was handling Rosie Greer after the shooting, and Bill Rathburn uh, subsequently became the chief of police, guess where, in Dallas. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and he went on to run security for the 96 Olympic Games in Atlanta. So these guys live very charmed lives. Now, when you were back out there in Montana going through those documents, is there anything else that stood out in the documentation that you thought, uh, you know, by the way, we know that this stuff's been sealed up for a long time. Mm-hmm. Uh, you apparently had stuff before they got to seal it up. Is there anything else that stands out in that documentation, Michael, that that, that brought you as a police officer to say, hey, what's going on here? This isn't the norm. Well, there was just 
a, a complete uh, failure of the SUS detectives to follow even normal police procedure with people who would have been witnesses there. It, there, was, uh, uh, there was evidence of the destruction of evidence. Uh, <laughs> they had destroyed door jams and door panels that contained bullet holes in them because they had a problem. Once they had said that Sirhan was the lone gunman with an eight-shot revolver, they couldn't have any more than eight bullet holes anywhere. Right. Otherwise, they were going to have a very serious problem explaining how that happened. So LAPD just willy-nilly, in a couple of cases, just burned, incinerated some door jams that had 22 caliber bullet holes in it. That's pretty, that, that's pretty uh, gross. Uh, uh, you know, and I, and I have to, who was DA at the time? Do you remember? Uh, Evel Younger. And I we, believe. And, and uh, did Younger play any role in this thing at all, personally? Do you remember? Well, uh, not so much that I know, but I'm sure he was aware of it to begin with because the prosecution of Sirhan was kind of a, of a, a railroad from start to finish. Sirhan's lawyer just kind of rolled over and, you know, counted him a plea and got him out of the trial. Uh, when any lawyer worth half of his salt could have, uh, could have gotten Sirhan a, a, a really good trial and probably acquitted him. I think it's fair to say, since you have... Uh, already interviewed both Lynn and uh, Larry Teeter that, you know, Sirhan has absolutely no memory to this day of the events that night in the pantry. Right. And and that goes to that Operation Artichoke, MK Ultra, and what have you, uh, which is the mind game stuff that CIA yeah. messes with. And maybe we'll talk a little bit about that when we come back. And But I'm trying to leave uh, the, the blank spot in his memory to one side and deal in the, the, the physical facts. And the physical facts, Michael, and, and don't let me put words in your mouth, but the physical facts in this case, which all of us old homicide cops deal with, just don't add up to what the uh, story is supposed to be. Absolutely do not, and under any circumstances. Uh, the conclusion that I came to was that in their arrogance, see, you have to put this in the historical context, Jerry, and this is what's really important to understand about LAPD then and maybe helps you understand what's going on with LAPD now, is that in the 50s, Bill Parker, our legendary chief, uh, of LAPD uh, had an enormous dislike of J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI. And in the city of Los Angeles, the relationships between LAPD and the FBI have been less than cordial, to say the least. On the other hand, Bill Parker loved CIA. Uh, he was very close with a guy named James Jesus Angleton, uh, and he loved the agency, and that's why we had a lot of agency people turning up in LAPD so that they could do things inside the U.S. Michael, hold that thought. We're going to take the top of the hour break here, and We'll be back, and if you want to join us, 252-1075, toll-free from the West Coast, 877-575-1075. I'm Jerry Pierce. I'm the radio detective, and my special guest is Michael C. Rupert, and we're talking about the killing of Kennedy down there in 1968 in the city of Los Angeles. Don't go away. Tonight, I've undertaken still another program having to do with the killing of Robert Kennedy on June 5, 1968, little after midnight. Ambassador Hotel, he had just won uh, the primaries, and, you know, this, this whole thing is uh, something I ask you to pay careful attention to, very careful attention to, because I, for one, have been an investigator for 35 years, both in law enforcement and in my private practice. And I can tell you that the physical facts alone, aside from everything else that my special guest and I are going to talk about tonight, the physical facts in this case alone leave room for not only uh, doubt, but extremely reasonable doubt that Sirhan was the one that killed Kennedy. Now, we're not saying Sirhan was not there. We're not saying that Sirhan did not have a gun in his hand. We're not saying any of that. What I'm telling you is that from the facts, all the facts that can be found in this case, Sirhan could not have killed Robert Kennedy. If the coroner of Los Angeles County's report is legitimately correct. And that is that Kennedy died from a contact wound behind the right ear. Plus he was shot twice in the armpit, the bullets traveling upward at a 70 roughly degree angle. And that further examination of the coroner's report indicates that the traveling of the bullets inside the body were from back to front. All the witnesses that were there that night had no pony in the race said that Sirhan at all times was in front of Robert Kennedy. 
So just stop and think about what I've just told you. Those are what facts they have. Sirhan's hand to kill Kennedy had to be behind his right ear. And we're discussing this case tonight. My special guest in the second hour as well is Michael C. Rupert. He's a former LAPD narcotics investigator and one of the sharpest pencils in the box. You've heard that in the first hour. He has a website for you to go to. Right on the net, www.copvcia, C-O-P, V as in Victor, and then CIA.com. That's www.copvcia.com. And you can read on that location some of the things that he and I are discussing on this show tonight. We also uh, are going to have Michael back in the future to talk more about the CIA and drugs issue. In fact, we may have him back a few times on that issue. As you recall, maybe you don't recall, if you didn't hear my show a year ago, I had Gary Webb on. And Gary Webb wrote about the CIA uh, putting drugs into Los Angeles and the minority communities. And, and or CIA cutouts or CIA uh, contract people. And Webb was castigated by his counterparts in the media. Webb was right. And you know why I know Webb was right? Because I worked the case with my staff along with DEA out of Mexico, which led us to the same place in Los Angeles, to the same players, to the same scenario and situation there. So Michael C. Rupert is one of these fellows that undertook to look into that. John Deutsch came out to Los Angeles on behalf of the CIA and held a meeting in South Central to try and convince the minority population there that the CIA would in no way ever bring drugs into their community. And it was Michael C. Rupert that stood up in the back of the room while I watched on television from Fresno and said, you're a liar. And that's when I first saw this gentleman. So I'm telling you that he has fortitude here. I've done a background investigation of him, and he's nothing there that would lead you to believe that he's anything but a straight shooter. And that's why I brought him on the show tonight, because he came across information after he joined LAPD that told him in no uncertain terms that there's something wrong with the investigation of the Kennedy killing and that his conclusion as he's researched it further was that LAPD at least members of LAPD and you know how I am about castigating all police officers over the acts of a few but certain members of the LAPD may have had an overt act in taking the life of the senator and I've told you what Rampart Division is all about lately we've talked about that on this show so I'm cautioning you again to pay attention to what I'm about to tell you I've had police work in my heart my entire life the Rampart Division presently that's going through this scandal for the corruption the horrible things they do there in that division does not mean that the other 675,000 to 700,000 sworn police officers, men and women across this country, should be held responsible for the acts of a few. There are very decent, honorable, hardworking, and dedicated police officers in this country that go to work every day to protect us. But when we have information that points to corruption, we have to dig it out, throw it up on the table, and beat it to death with a mallet. And that's what Michael and I are doing here tonight. We're bringing out the facts as we know them to be. We're giving it to you, and that's all we can do. So if you want to join the show in this hour, I'll open up the lines 252-1075 and toll-free 877-575-1075. Michael, welcome back, sir. It's a pleasure. Uh, you know, I'm going to get back to where you were at on that, but I just want to make one mention before we get back to you on, on what you were about to say. My research shows in this radio log, the material I got a hold of, that they put out the description, uh, uh, you know, regarding what would amount maybe to be Sirhan. But uh, then we get into this this back and forth on the radio, and there was a description of a suspect in the shooting there, and, and it's logged at 3400 Wilshire, which is... Uh, of course, the hotel. That's the hotel, yeah. And uh, they put it out as 20 to 22 years of age, six foot to six foot two, thin build, blonde curly hair, wearing brown pants and a light brown shirt. Uh, direction taken at the time unknown. 
And it sort of went down that Sirhan was, by, by the way, short, dark-haired, wearing a light blue shirt and blue pants. Right. And so this couldn't be a mix-up between that description and the other one. Uh, there was a third suspect uh, re referred to in this whole thing. But when the deal went down, about 12.34 a.m., at 114 to 33, it says, is a suspect in custody or what's the story? At 0034. And then it says he left approximately five minutes ago. He was taken into plus, uh, into custody in a police car. There was another suspect being held within the building, and I sent Nunley into blank. 114 to 70 boy, one suspect in custody, one suspect inside the building. Is there a supervisor up at the station? 2L30, 2L30, come in. 2L30, go. 2L30, the description we have is a male Latin, 25, 26, 5, 5, bush hair, dark eyes, light build, wearing a blue jacket and blue Levi's and blue tennis shoes. Do you have anything to add? There's a hesitation. 2L30. That's not the description I put out. 2L30. The description I put out was a male Caucasian. 20 to 22. Approximately 6'1 to 6'2. Sandy blonde curly hair and wearing brown pants and a light tan shirt. Rampart Station to TAC-1 units. We now have a base station set up in the watch commander's office. Rampart Station, KMA-367. 2L-10, go. 2L-30, Roger. 2L-30, would you suggest I contact Rampart detectives and find if this suspect is in custody? Affirmative 21-1. Attention units in the vicinity of the Ambassador Hotel. Suspect's description is a male Caucasian. 20 to 22, 6 foot to 6 foot 2. Sandy blonde curly hair, brown pants, Light tan shirt, end of description. 2L30 to control, come in. 2L30, go ahead. 2L30, code 2 on that bus. Affirmative. 2L30, the second suspect came from a witness who was pushed over by this suspect. Witness and his wife, we have the name and address. At 0144 a.m., the juvenile officers were collecting witnesses initially, have a sheet of paper with a name and address and the phone number of the witness. What proximity to the shooting were these people? Staff 9, Staff 9, come into Control 1. 2L30, in what proximity were these two witnesses? 2L30, they were adjacent to the room. 2L30, disregard the broadcast. We've got Rayford Johnson and Jesse Unruh, who were right next to him, and they only have one, and they don't want them to get anything started on a big conspiracy. This could be somebody that was, and then it's blank. So I won't go on with it, Michael. No. But you can, re you can read where I'm going because you've, you've used that radio system. <laughs> Boy, do I know that. Yeah, I was, you did that very well, as a matter of fact. Uh, basically, I, I've, what used, that, I've used it a little bit, too. <laughs> yeah, what, what that what Staff 9, by the way, I don't know uh, what Staff 9 represented, but it was someone from Parker Center. Staff meaning it is uh, in the command structure of right. LAPD right. outside of a divisional unit. Uh, that's a, that was a very mysterious thing. Why would a Staff 9 guy be out there at uh, almost 1 o'clock in the morning? Shouldn't right. have been. Right. Uh, and this was about the time when Kirby was showing up and there was a blackout there. But this was when they were trying to put out these other descriptions, and, and clearly people were putting a lid on it. If you look, there are other uh, taped interviews, particularly with one very, very credible witness, God bless her, named Sandy Serrano, who held her story, held her mud through the most unbelievable browbeating by Hank Hernandez, which is on tape, by the way, uh, who insisted that she ran into on the back stairs the two people coming out, one of whom was a blonde guy, saying, we shot him, we shot him. Uh, and Sandy uh, was just amazing. She gave live television interviews uh, that night of the shooting. Now, she has almost been in hiding ever since. Mm -hmm. But the BBC came up with a tape of Hank Hernandez polygraphing her uh, in which he says, he, he's saying to her things like, now come on, before God and Jesus Christ, you know that your soul is on the line here. You did not see those people. I mean, that's the kind of tactics this polygrapher was using with her, and he was browbeating her mercilessly. Right. And, and this is a guy who bragged that he uh, worked for CIA. Right, right. Well, listen, we're going to take a short break, and uh, we're going to come back, Michael, so rest yourself there for just a couple minutes. And for those of you in the audience, uh, I'm going to have Michael here the rest of the half hour and we're not going to do three hours tonight with him uh so if you want to talk to him it's time 252-1075 toll free 877-575-1075 i'm jerry pierce your radio detective we're talking about the assassination 
of Senator Robert F. Kennedy on June 5, 68. Be right back. 211 to 187. He'll put the perp in the joint by 11. Jerry Pierce, the radio detective. Welcome back to the show after the break. This portion of the show is brought to you by the California Correctional Peace Officers Association. They walk the toughest beat in the state, and boy, do I know that now. After my broadcast from the Corcoran State Prison the other day and my tour of that facility, I'm proud to have the CCPOA and their 28,000-plus members as sponsors of the Radio Detective program. We're talking about the killing of Robert Kennedy tonight. We've got a fascinating guest on the show with us. Michael C. Rupert is a former Los Angeles narcotics investigator, and he has stumbled across some information, really, after he was on LAPD that pointed back to the killing of uh, Robert Kennedy, June 5th, 1968. And uh, he and I are discussing it, and we're at a point where we're talking about some of the things that were out of order regarding the transmission and the radio uh, work that went on that night. And, and uh, as he pointed out before the break, it's unusual to have a Staff 9 call uh, that late at night, which means it's up at a higher level in the uh, entire department. Um, and so let's talk some more about that, Michael, if we can, and kind of follow this through with some of the other in- unusual ties in the case. And in a moment, I want to get over to uh, the criminalist in this, Wolper, and, uh, and some of the ties there to some interesting things as well. Uh, but let's go back to the radio call. So we've got these guys on... They're running around. You've already said that some of the metro units had moved into the hospital area prior to the shooting uh, yeah. and indicating that in some of the data you reviewed. And I've just read to you, my uh, got my hands on some radio traffic, uh, that 2L30 clearly put out a broadcast uh, for someone other than uh, what amounted to uh, Sirhan. Correct. And then we have the girl in the polka dot dress issue, which continually comes up. By the way, have you heard about... Uh, uh, this polka dot dress gal committing suicide out in the West End there several weeks after this or a couple months after this? I've heard rumors to that effect, but I've never seen anything that convinced me one way or the other that it did or did not happen. So. You know, I want to investigate that personally for this show. I, I want to find out. Uh, I, there's somewhere along the line somebody knows, and I don't remember right now who it is, but once I get a hold of them, I'll get a hold of you, and let's kick it around uh, because I think we ought to pull the coroner's records on that case. Okay. These these suicides in the CIA, you know how that deal goes. <laughs> I once sponsored a conference in, uh, this was in the winter of uh, December of 93, in southern Indiana uh, for the families of more than 20 people in the U.S. military uh, whose sons, husbands, uh, fathers, brothers had allegedly committed suicide, yet they were handcuffed and shot in the back of the head, you know, shot multiple times with shotguns from a long range. Um, and these, uh, these, these suiciding's uh, occur fairly regularly all around covert operations. I'll take that, what's his name, Don Air del Toro, the Marine, you know. That, Jim Sabo. I, yeah, yeah I've, I've investigated the Sabo case off the air because the cases I had in my in my private investigation. My son and I run the Pierce Corporation. We're a corporate intelligence company, and we've investigated the Sabo thing on three different occasions tied to three different other cases. I know his brother, David Sabo, very the well. Doctor, He's a good yeah. friend. That case was just thrown out, by the way, of U.S. District Court in Orange County. It was trashed, I believe, intentionally by the guy who was posing as the uh, friendly lawyer for the Sabo family, Daniel Sheehan. Yeah, well, you see, Sabo's brother is a uh, was a brain surgeon, isn't he? Uh, no, he's an os- osteopathic surgeon, I believe. He's from South Dakota. Yeah, well, and, he was he was questioning that whole. I don't want to get too far off into that case. That's another show for you and right. I to do. But he was questioning that whole business, the whole medical end of the business, and. Nobody would listen to him. No. And and Jim was clearly getting ready to talk about the use of C-130s by the CIA to smuggle two and 3,000 kilos of cocaine at a time, and they were flying it right on to El Toro. That's a whole other show, Michael. We're Absolutely. Gonna do, we're going to do that one, too, I assure you. Uh, let's go back to Kennedy, and we had some calls here waiting to talk to you, but I want to I want to get to one thing, in, at least in this portion of the show, and that is this Ace Security Company. Why don't you run that down to us a little bit? Well, ACE is a private contract security company uh, in California. It was in 1968, um, and it works pretty much the same as private contract companies do all over the U.S. Uh, the, the guards are civilians. Uh, Thane Cesar had, according to LAPD records, uh, been working for ACE for a short period of time. I don't recall exactly how long before the assassination, but he had previously been employed by Lockheed Aircraft. 
Well, what was fascinating was that when I was with John Christian and, and we're going through all these LAPD records, John dr- dropped this huge bombshell. John looked at me and he said, do you know who the president of A Security is now? And I said, no. He said, well, it's a guy named Dwayne Wolfer. And Dwayne Wolfer was the FID, Scientific Investigation Division, criminalist who absolutely lied through his teeth about all of the evidence in the Bobby Kennedy assassination. And here he winds up 25 years later as the president of the security company that was employing the assassin. Yeah, yeah an interesting tie, you think, huh? Uh, yeah, that's kind of suspicious. It's a clue, Jerry. It's what we call a clue. Yeah, and i got a friend, Ed Bates, uses that same approach. He's the former sheriff of Madera County. He's on here a lot with me, and he says, yeah, Jerry, that's what we call a clue. Yeah. <laughs> Let's take a call, okay? Let's go to Maureen in Clovis, California. Maureen, welcome to the show. Hon. Good evening. Hi. Hi. I'll make this quick. Um, my question would be, um, just if I could play devil's advocate, mm-hmm. if this really did involve um, the CIA, why would they do this in such a splashy um, way? Why all the fanfare? Why not just, you know, poisonous coffee at a restaurant? Why, maybe, you know, your guest could explain, you know, why, you know, I, I believe that it's possible, mm-hmm. and there seems to be a lot of, you know, evidence that certainly indicates that uh, Sirhan may not have been the shootist, but, um, but, you know, why Why not? I mean, would, would there be some purpose? Because I, I think about John Kennedy's assassination, too. Mm-hmm. And, of course, he was a president maybe harder to get to. Um, uh, and there was no Secret Service protecting Bobby Kennedy at the time right. he was running. But why not just, you know, have, uh, you know, certainly you could get, you know, you could get someone to be a, uh, like an agent, you know, contract to work in a, in a restaurant as a, as a waiter or waitress and slip something in somebody's coffee and then slip off the bat. Very, very simple explanation for that. You lose the value of the object lesson. I'm sorry? You lose the value of the object lesson. Okay. What I mean by that is on the day that John Kennedy was killed, Lyndon Johnson was three cars back in mm-hmm. the motorcade, maybe four cars back. And you know what he said? Yeah. My God, they could have got me, too. Yeah. Um, there were three notable assassinations, John Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, and Martin Luther King. The agency had a role in all three of them. All three of those men had, uh, in one way or another, taken on the power system that runs the CIA, the military-industrial complex, as Ike used to call it. Uh, Martin Luther King had crossed the line to become an anti-war activist, which is what was his death sentence. And the object lesson for all from all of those assassinations, was to anybody else, if you speak out against us, this will happen to you too. And also, I might add something, Michael and Maureen. They have to have plausible deniability in these kinds of things. And, and let me let me say to you that if it was a sneaky killing regarding uh, Senator Kennedy or even the president or anybody else, if it was one of these backroom deals and covert and sneaky then fingers would point immediately to some intelligence operation or something like that, okay? But where it's done publicly, out in the open, in front of all these people, and there's guns blazing and all this crazy stuff going on, then there's plausible deniability. Well, who, how could the CIA, the mafia, or anybody else be involved? This is crazy guy shot the, shot the, uh, shot the senator. But what is more remarkable to me than any of that is the fact that these things were available... Uh, to his attorney at the time, not the one now, but at the time, and that if you take the case of why he didn't make more out of this at the time, his attorney was under indictment for a Friars Club scandal in Los Angeles at the time, and that Friars Club scandal involved uh, prostitution and gaming run by the organized crime interest in L.A., and he was made a deal. So there was, and I'm talking about Sirhan's lawyer. You're right. Were the charges dropped? Oh, yeah, he got skin-free out of that deal, and, and and nothing happened to him, and and it was a heavy deal. I mean, this was a heavy case. So there's a lot of things here. We haven't finished yet, Maureen. No, right? I mean, you almost have me convinced. It's just that I... Well, you don't have... Here's what I want to convince you of. I don't want to convince you of anything other than if you'll go along with me tonight and trust me when I tell you that this gentleman on the phone with me and I have looked at the official medical reports of the autopsy, and if you'll trust me to tell you that they reflect what I've said on the air, it does. And if you trust me to tell you that the witnesses, every witness, and I think Michael will back me up, that could be found and interviewed that had no pony in the race, in other words, no interest one way or the other, 
have placed Sirhan at all times in front of Kennedy. If you'll go that far with me, that's yeah. enough. That's yeah. enough. And what this guy, Sirhan, is trying to do, as I understand it, as I ask uh, uh, Miss Mangan, he simply wants a hearing on the evidence. He doesn't want to try and prove he didn't wasn't there or anything like that. Now, he wants a hearing on the evidence. He's concerned that you know, and this I'm not taking his side here, he's concerned that you know that he was not the one that actually killed the senator. And uh, he doesn't deny he was there. He doesn't deny that other. The second level of that is is that he feels he can't answer why that he was either taken advantage of, programmed somehow. And we haven't talked about MK Ultra, Operation Artichoke, the studies that were being done by the CIA regarding the Manchurian candidate type stuff. We haven't done, and those are facts. I mean, those are real programs that were funded to see if they could form an assassination by controlling somebody's mind. Those are things the CIA was right. up to. But even beyond that, it would seem a more pivotal issue would be to, to, to prove that he, he could not have fired those shots. That's absolutely the point I'm making with you. If you'll go along with me that far, then at least we have an open mind to whatever yeah. follows. And Which the show. same issue with the magic bullet and JFK. I mean, if you focus on the one thing that can't be true, then everything else falls apart. And what can't be true with Bobby Kennedy is that Sirhan was close enough to uh, shoot Bobby from behind. Um, there's, some, there's some other very interesting stuff, and I want to mention this, Jerry, because people can actually go to my website and see this right now. That if they go to uh, www.copvcia.com, and I have a search engine there, they can just enter uh, RFK or uh, uh, Bobby Kennedy right. and search and find the story that I have there. It's also in the assassination section. They can scroll down to the bottom of the story that I have up on the website, and I have an LAPD file document a, a, uh, from SUS, Special Unit Senator, on the website, where they went out to the stables where Sirhan had been working at Santa Anita, no mob connections there, yuck, yuck, mm -hmm. and they interviewed a man who had been working with Sirhan, and that man's name, and you see it right on the report, is Thomas Bremer. Right. Thomas Bremer is the brother of Arthur Bremer, who shot Governor George Wallace. Right. Mm. And both Thomas Bremer and his sister were employed at Santa Anita Racetrack at the exact same place and time where Sirhan was hypno programmed. Right. And do you remember uh, the LAPD detective uh, they used to wait, lay the wires down on everybody that bugged the uh, uh, different places, including Marilyn Monroe's apartment? Good. And, uh, yeah. Okay. And Good. he. he uh, he also was connected with the racetrack. And you got to remember that Bobby Kennedy was involved with Monroe and that one of those bugs in Marilyn Monroe's room picked up Kennedy and Lawford in the room at the time. And Kennedy was swearing, and he would kept saying, where is that S? Where is it? Where is it? He was looking for something. That's a fact. And that Sam Giancana had some ties to that whole scenario, if you recall. Mm -hmm. He also had ties to Carlos Marcellos in New Orleans mm -hmm. and to the John Kennedy situation. In fact, there's a book out called Double Cross. It's before me right here. And the two boys, Sam and Giancana's two sons, write in there about their conversations with their father and friends where they took uh, uh, took credit for both hits and, and dealing with the CIA. So that these are little parts and pieces, Maureen, that we're bringing into it for you. But all we can do, all I can do here is this radio detective is put it out to you and just, just have you see what you want to do with it, okay? Well, great. Thank hey, Maureen. Much. Thank you, hon. That's Maureen from Clovis checking in. We're going to take a short break, come back. Malcolm, you're next, and then John in Fresno, you're next. Michael, hold on. We'll be right back after this. My guest is Michael C. Rupert. He's a former LAPD narcotics officer. He's also one of the sharpest investigators on the planet. He is my special guest talking about the killing of Robert Kennedy. Don't go away. You're on the case with Jerry Pierce. Real crime in real time. Inside the walls of prison. My body may be, but the Lord has set my soul free. The Radio Detective. Welcome back to the show. I'm Jerry Pierce, your Radio Detective. We're investigating tonight the killing of Robert Kennedy, June 5, 1968, Ambassador Hotel, Los Angeles, California. My special guest is Michael C. Rupert. He is a former Los Angeles police officer and was a narcotics officer. Now, we're going to have Michael back in the future for some other shows having to do with drugs. Uh, he has a website, www.copvcia, that's C-O-P, V as in Victor, C-I-A dot com. And you need to visit the website. You'll learn more about this gentleman than you'll learn anyplace else because it's a huge website. 
with all kinds of material there that every citizen in this country should be aware of. And he's my special guest in this hour. He was on the department when he came across, as he described in the first hour of the show, some information pertaining to LAPD's role in the handling of the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy. He's made some conclusions, as have I, that Sirhan probably wasn't the shooter, or he wasn't the killer of Kennedy. In fact, I've made that conclusion. I'll, I'll admit it to you. There's no way physically, according to the autopsy reports, that this guy Sirhan could have done this. Now, we're not saying Sirhan wasn't there. We're not saying Sirhan didn't fire a gun. We know that pretty much to be the, fa the, the facts. Uh, we've talked a little bit about Operation Artichoke, uh, MK Ultra. Uh, we've talked, uh, and by the way, I put a call out to Dr. Matlock, and Dr. Matlock is going to be here in the future to tell us about drugs that can be used to block out the memory. He said, well, there's no big secret about that, and he started to explain. I said, save it. I said, we're going to get you on the show and, and uh, have you explain it to the listeners on how all that happens. And so that's a whole other facet we'll cover next show. Right now, we're talking about the physical facts and the corruptive information in the LAPD investigation of this case and maybe ties to CIA and organized crime. And when this gentleman tells you that there are CIA operatives in police departments, trust me, I've been around a long time. I knew that to be the case in 1963. The CIA does place agents in police departments in this country. And I won't go into why tonight, but that's just standard practice. So having said that, welcome back, Mike. A pleasure. Let's uh, let's go back to the call board here and go to Malcolm in Brisbane, California. Malcolm, welcome to the show, sir. Hi. How are you? Are you there? Hi, I'm here. Go ahead, please. Go ahead, Malcolm. You're on the air. Yeah. Um, I, I've listened to the show tonight, and um, there's a... There's a a couple of questions I'd like to ask Michael. When did Michael join the force in LAPD? I started as an intern while I was an undergraduate at UCLA in 1969. I became well, one thing you confirmed for me was um, one thing I had read shortly after, within a year or two of the assassination, was the fact that um, TAC-1 and TAC-2 went down that night. Yes. And you confirmed that they went down for nine minutes? That's what I, that, that's what I gleaned from going through the records up in Montana, yes. Yeah, and let me tell you where I, that information came from. After, I, was, I was 19 years old, one week from graduating from high school at Hollywood High School, mm -hmm. when the assassination took place. I loved Robert Kennedy, hated Sirhan when I heard that Sirhan had did it until I realized within about a six months to a year that Sirhan was not the one who did it. Correct. Um, I'll tell you what a great treasure trove, and it may not be something that there is that you can get access to, but if you recall, um, there was an alternative newspaper in Los Angeles, the Los Angeles Free Press. Yes. And they went on, and they, and they, they printed story after story concerning the Robert Kennedy assassination, for the next year or so, when the two major newspapers, the L.A. Times and the Herald Examiner, ceased writing much of anything about it at all, except the official line. And if there are any archives left on these stories, um, if you can get a hold of them, you're going to find out a lot of things. And they're written by journalists who later went on to become pretty well-known journalists. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now... One of the things that was mentioned at the time, and I remember this clearly, concerning Saint Eugene Cesar, there's a number of points. One point was, and I'm going to put this under the category of alleged, because I don't defame anybody, and I want to make sure that this is the way it's presented. One was that he had a connection to um, the owner of the, or the operator of the, of the Caliani racetrack, John Alessio, and John Alessio, for, as far as I know, and, and my understanding is, had a lot of organized crime connections. That's, and the that's, Cesar that's true, had a relationship with John Alessio. That was number one. I remember that clearly. Number two, there was a story, I don't remember whether the Free Press was the one who published it. They may have been, it may have been another story, was to, to the effect that Cesar sold his gun the 22 caliber revolver, which is very ironic because that was the same caliber that, that Sirhan 
apparently had that night. Right. My understanding was, and this is the way the story went as far as I can recall it at the time, and I lived down there at the time, so I remember this, was that he had sold the gun that he had that night to an individual who later confirmed that, yeah, Cesar had sold him the gun, but somehow the gun disappeared. Either it was stolen or it disappeared. And the individual who confirmed that, yes, Cesar had sold him the gun, um, said that that was the case. I don't recall who the individual was. I, I recall this, that uh, story. This report, yes. I don't remember the exact detail. But you're right. Cesar did sell a 22. The 22 he had that night? Well, I don't remember, and I'm not going to speculate. Uh, I, neither would I. Yeah. But. but, but I mean, I find that very unusual, and I find <laughs> a lot it of unusual, unusual that stuff, Cesar, yeah. who wasn't even supposed to be there that night, had the same caliber weapon that Sirhan had. And by, by virtue of that alone, that creates a lot of very interesting implications. Um, the other thing in terms of what Jerry mentioned earlier, in terms of the Sam Giancana book written by his nephews, book Double Cross, which I've read. Um, there are a lot of things in that book in which Giancana essentially, his nephews take credit for the death of Marilyn Monroe, the death of JFK, and later the death of RFK. I kind of think in some ways there's a lot of glorification in there because Sam Giancana was a very powerful man, but I'm not sure that he, he was that powerful. If you read that book, he kind of gives you the impression that he sent his best friend, Chucky Nicoletti, to Dealey Plaza to take care of JFK. Well, Chucky Nicoletti, his best friend, had a reputation for doing what a lot of mafia types do, killing people in the backseat of a car by choking them to death. This is not the kind of person you send with a high-caliber rifle to assassinate the President of the United States. So I think... There's, there's, a, there's a certain amount of bragging in that book. I have to ag agree with you totally. Yes. Whereas I am convinced that organized crime and the mafia had roles. Oh, you bet. In both assassinations. You bet. Only the Central Intelligence Agency had the, the uh, clout and the power to move uh, communications operations, military operations, law enforcement people. Only the CIA had, had that much clout. Michael, I agree with you 100%. Malcolm? This is Jerry. Let me, let me just tell both of you. Uh, organized crime mafia, Sicilian mafia is my specialty. Sam Giancana was sleeping with Marilyn Monroe at the yes, same time was. Bobby Kennedy was. There's a wire, and I'm trying to get a hold of the transcript of it, that neither of you will ever get unless I can get it, that clearly is done on Sam himself uh, by Freddie Otash. Mm -hmm. And Freddie Fred Otash, Freddy Otash hung the wire in Maryland's apartment. He also he also wired the mob guy, uh, Giancana. When Giancana says, I'm going to kill Kennedy if he gets around her one more time. Yep. So I'm just telling you, there's more to that Giancana thing than you realize. Trust me on that a little bit. But keep in mind that it wasn't just Marilyn Monroe. Sam Giancana had a relationship with Judy Exner. Right. And... and JFK was also sleeping with Judy Exner. You're right. And, and I'm so, trying to get a hold of that, but I don't want to put it out until I get it in my hands. No, I understand that, To Jerry. be fair to everything. Malcolm, i got to run to the next one. Good enough. Hey, thank you, sir, for the call from Brisbane. I appreciate it. Let's go to John in Fresno. John, welcome to the show. Uh, how are you, Jerry? How are you? And hello to uh, Michael. Is that his name? Yes. Yep. Yeah, well, it's a pleasure to speak with you, sir. I'm. Uh, you kind of uh, reinforce our hope that, you know, that there's honorable people out there. Thank you. All right. And I'm definitely going to go visit your website here uh, in the future. Uh, Jerry, just a small backup question here. I was listening to the show when Sirhan's brother was on. Mm -hmm. Adele, now, Adele Sirhan. That's right. Now, I don't know whether I missed this or what, but now everybody admits that he had this gun. What was the explanation for why he had this gun there? Well, I haven't got into that on tonight's program because that's a show in and of itself, which I'll, okay. I'm going to do. But that has to do... Uh, with the mind control, and this all sounds uh, screwy, but trust okay. me, all right, the, I, government, hold on that one, the government now, has programs called Artichoke and MK Ultra, 
and I'm going to introduce everybody to that, but I want to do it separately from the physical side of the case. Okay, that sounds good. And I also want to throw in a little something about MK Ultra. that uh, U-2 base, or was it the U-2 plane uh, there in Japan? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. They tell me that was a, uh, a major center of that operation. It was not only in Japan, it was in a lot of... Well, I don't want to get into that tonight, though. Okay. Uh, could I ask, uh, or I'm trying to, you know, explain to people about this tie, because that's, I called in the last time you had the show here mm-hmm. on that, and if uh, somebody was going to get stung in the back of the neck by, say, a wasp or a hornet, mm-hmm. isn't that where you would swat? Yep. Right where they're stinging you? Oh, yeah. So, in other words, it's not unreasonable to assume that... The, 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 the pain sensation caused Bobby to reach back and catch this guy's tie. Well, you know, Michael, uh, I'll have you comment on that, but what Michael pointed out was that's the famous picture with him holding that tie, and either that or you're trying to grab the guy you know just shot you. That's exactly right. And you know what happens when, when I was back in police work? We wore breakaway ties on our uniforms because these idiots would come up and grab you. The guys that in the old days would wear tie ties and the suspect would grab the tie and choke you half to death. So they put out these breakaway ties for cops to wear. and and But I, I'm going to assume, John, and Michael, correct me here if you think I'm, I'm too far off on this, that what happened, he reached up to grab the guy that just shot him, and his tie was a breakaway-type tie, which is police-type ties. That's right? exactly what I think, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I still think, you know, when they say that a, uh, a, a good picture is worth a, a, a thousand words, you know, when you started out your dialogue with that, everybody knows that that impressed in our memory and that th- that was like a final message that one scratches out with their last ounce of energy it's a good way to put it john john yeah, thanks for th- go ahead Mike. Funny, uh, bobby kennedy's uh, last words were were officially is everybody else okay is anybody else hurt he right. was thinking about other people so he knew he'd been shot i mean there was yeah. no question he wasn't in any coma or anything he knew he'd been shot and he probably knew who shot him and he's still worried about other people right yeah. uh hey john uh, thanks for the call thank you sir Let's go uh, to, let's see here, Jason. Let's go up to Albert's been waiting in Modesto, California. Albert, welcome to the show. Hi. How are you? Uh, yeah, I'm great. I, I'm calling because um, I like the show, but I'm surprised that you're not talking about another Kennedy. Okay. Um, John John. Okay, what about him? <laughs> because, you know, uh, um, I mean, uh, what was that, the, the Korean, I mean, the, I mean, the uh, Egyptian airline, it crashed like 60 miles. You know, I, in the same area. Yeah, I, I've heard all that, and and we we're looking at the John John deal, but I've also flown the same kind of plane he was in. Right. And I just think he lost it, frankly. Yeah, but all he had to do is, if if he was going to lose it, all he had to do is flip a switch. No, 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 no trust me on that. I mean, it's not that simple. When you're, I don't want to, uh, Albert. Can you call me on another night, and unless you want to talk about Robert Kennedy. If I get off into flying airplanes, I've only got five, four minutes left. Okay. And let's not get into that tonight. It's not that I want to put you off on it because it's interesting stuff. But if we're going to talk about that, let's do it on a separate night, okay? Okay. I thought that since they're in the same family, and it's, you know, oh, no, you're, you're right. It's a, it's in the same family. It all has mystery around it. But let's do that uh, whole business with the airplane on another okay. night. Okay? All right. Thanks. Really, let me also, if I may. You bet. And for any of your listeners who subscribe to From the Wilderness, uh, and we have a number you can call. It's an 800 number, 1-800-META-911, M-E-T-A-911. Okay. If they mention your name, I will give them three back issues free of charge just for saying Jerry Pierce when they call to subscribe. Perfect. And and for your last caller, I have written about both John John and Egypt Air 990. I, I agree with him, and I'll send him the back issues on that. Perfect. There you go, Albert. Uh Get on that website and uh, get 1-800-META, M-E-T-A, 911, and get this from Mike himself, and you're home free on that uh, whole theory. Let's go to Greg in Visalia. Greg, this will be the last call of the night. Welcome to the show, sir. Greg, uh, i got to turn your radio down, Greg. Greg, turn your radio down. Hey, Mike. Yes. Hey, uh, here's the question I got for you. What advantage would the CIA have by having Robert and or John Kennedy dead? Was, were the, was, you know, was Robert Kennedy opposed to the military-industrial complex? Were they linked up with the mafia and some mafia hitters did them? I mean, what, how would it benefit them for, for that guy to be dead? I've written heavily about the history of CIA, and I lecture about it at colleges. The CIA is an agency that works for and on behalf of Wall Street. 
was created by bankers and Wall Street lawyers. Uh, Bill Casey was a, was a Wall Street lawyer. Uh, the Dulles brothers were as well. Bobby Kennedy was going to immediately end the Vietnam War, which was generating billions of dollars in revenue for the military-industrial complex. Okay. And he also, uh, uh, is, is Greg gone? Okay, Greg got his answer. Mike, in the last minute or so here, uh, let's do another one uh, coming up pretty soon, okay? Absolutely. And, and we'll get down into the CIA for these folks, and uh, we'll just get into it. Just get into it right up to our elbows and and start wading around in that territory for them. And you're an expert in there, and I think that'll make a fascinating show. But in the end here, give me your overview. Uh, and we haven't talked about the mine stuff. I mean, we need no. to do that next time. But give them an overview of what you feel happened at the Ambassador Hotel that night. Very clearly, Sir Han, uh, Bashar Sirhan was a hypno-programmed patsy. He was set up to be a diversion, firing blanks, and to take the fall to fulfill the myth of the lone assassin established by Alan Dulles after John Kennedy was killed, and he fulfilled that role perfectly. Uh, the CIA had to kill John Kennedy that night because after, uh, Bobby that night, because after having won the California primary, he would have had Secret Service protection because he had just won the presidential nomination for, for the Democratic Party. Perfect. And with LAPD as their partner, the CIA had their last best chance in L.A. that night. Michael Rupert, I appreciate it. Would you hang on? The super producer, Jason Cunningham, wants to talk to you after the show. And uh, I thank you for being here, sir. I'd be happy to, Jerry. It was my pleasure. Okay. Now stay tuned for Alan Favish and the Killing of Vince Foster. Some new information coming up in the next hour. I'm Jerry Pierce, the radio detective. Don't go away.